Welcome to the next installment of my video lecture series for managerial economics. We're going to be taking a look at chapters, chapter 12, the Q&As. As always, I try to do these in a little bit more detail in a video format because in the book, sometimes they skip through some steps and if students are having difficulty understanding the Q&As, I, I thought that it might be beneficial to go through them in a little bit more detail. So we're going to take a look, of course, at Q&A. 12.1. And in this one, it states, suppose Procter and Gamble, P, G, and Johnson and Johnson, J and J, are simultaneously considering new advertising campaigns. Each firm may choose a high, medium, or low level of advertising. The payoff matrix is right here. So we have the three strategies. One for Procter and Gamble, they can choose high, medium, and low. For Johnson & Johnson, they also can choose high, medium, and low. And each of these cells here in this payoff matrix gives the individual payoffs for when Johnson & Johnson and Procter & Gamble select a specific advertising strategy. And the one thing I want you to note is that for Johnson & Johnson, the lower triangles in yellow are what's important. So, for example, when we take a look at Johnson & Johnson and High, their payoffs are 1 when Procter & Gamble is high, 3 when Procter & Gamble has a medium, a medium intensity strategy, and 5 when Procter & Gamble has a low intensity advertising strategy. So these nine cells represent the nine different outcomes. And in yellow, we have Johnson & Johnson. Uh, profits and in green we have Procter and Gamble's profits. And the Q and A asks, what are each firm's best responses to each of its rival strategies? Does either firm have a dominant strategy? And what is the Nash equilibrium? So let's take a look at this in detail. And what we're going to do is take a look at specific strategies to make a determination of what is the best response for each one. So let's take a look here uh, for high, and as you can see here, we're going to only be considering that Johnson & Johnson has a high-intensity advertising strategy, and then we're going to take a look at all of Procter & Gamble's strategies relative to that to see which has the highest payoff. And if we see that if Johnson & Johnson has a high-intensity advertising campaign and Procter & Gamble has a high-intensity advertising campaign, their Procter & Gamble's profits will only will equal 1. If Procter & Gamble responds with a medium when Johnson & Johnson has a high-intensity advertising strategy, Procter & Gamble's profits will be equal to 2. And if they Procter & Gamble decides on a low intensity strategy when Johnson & Johnson has a high intensity strategy, they have a, Procter & Gamble will have a payoff of three. And you can see that if Johnson & Johnson instigates a high intensity advertising campaign, Procter & Gamble's best response is low because they will have profits of three and it will be only two if they have a medium strategy and one if they have a high strategy. So if Johnson & Johnson picks high, then Procter & Gamble is better off by picking low. Let's take a look at what occurs if we hold Johnson & Johnson to a medium intensity strategy for advertising. So Johnson & Johnson, we're only going to be considering right here, the center of the matrix horizontally. All right, so this part right here is the only one we're going to concern ourselves with, and let's take a look at Procter & Gamble's strategies. Procter & Gamble institute a high-intensity strategy. Their profits will equal three. If they engage in a medium, it will be equal to four. And if they engage in a low-intensity advertising strategy, their profits will be equal to five. So they're better off with a low strategy when Johnson & Johnson engages in a medium strategy. Finally, we're going to take a look at what will occur when Johnson & Johnson engages in a low-intensity advertising strategy. So all we're concerned about is this bottom portion of the matrix and comparing the outcomes for Procter & Gamble relative to their own strategies. So if Johnson & Johnson were to engage in a low strategy, 
and Procter & Gamble engages in a high, Procter & Gamble's profits will equal five. If Procter & Gamble engages in a medium intensity strategy, when Johnson & Johnson engages in a low strategy, Procter & Gamble's profits will equal six. And if Johnson & Johnson maintains that low strategy, low intensity strategy for advertising, and Procter & Gamble engages in a low intensity strategy also, their profits will equal five. So out of all of these three potential strategies, Procter & Gamble is better off engaging in a medium strategy because their profits will equal six if they, when Johnson & Johnson has a low intensity strategy, if they switch to high or low, their profits will fall to five in both instances, so they are better off engaging in a medium strategy. Let's do the same thing, except we're going to hold Procter & Gamble strategy constant and take a look at what's the best payoff for Johnson & Johnson. So let's assume that Procter & Gamble is engaging in a high intensity strategy. Let's take a look at the profits for Johnson & Johnson when they engage in the different strategies, low, medium, and high for advertising. If Johnson & Johnson matches with a high strategy, their profits will only equal one. If they engage in a medium strategy when Procter & Gamble is in is engaged in a high intensity advertising strategy, Johnson & Johnson's profits will equal to two. And if Procter & Gamble engages in a high intensity strategy for advertising and Johnson & Johnson engages in a low, their profits will equal to three. Thus, if Procter & Gamble engages in a high strategy, high intensity strategy for advertising, Johnson & Johnson's best response is for a low intensity advertising strategy. Now let's hold Procter & Gamble's strategy to a medium level intensity advertising. So we're going to be concerned with this middle column, excuse me, of the payoff matrix. And let's compare the outcomes or the profits for Johnson & Johnson for their three separate strategies. So we have Procter & Gamble engaging in the medium. If Johnson & Johnson engages in a high intensity advertising strategy, their profits will equal three. If Johnson & Johnson engages in a medium intensive ad advertising strategy, profits will equal four. And if Procter & Gamble engages in a medium intensity advertising strategy and Johnson & Johnson engages in a low intensity advertising strategy, their profits, Johnson & Johnson's profits will equal to five. Thus, Johnson & Johnson is better off with a low intensity advertising strategy when Procter & Gamble engages in a medium intensity advertising strategy. Now let's take a look if we hold Procter & Gamble constant at a low intensity advertising strategy. John, if Johnson & Johnson engages in a high intensity advertising strategy, their profits, Johnson & Johnson's profits will equal to five. If they engage in a medium intensity advertising strategy, Johnson & Johnson's profits will equal six. And if Johnson & Johnson engages in a low-intensity advertising strategy, their profits will be equal to seven when Procter & Gamble engages in a low-intensity advertising strategy. So whenever Procter & Gamble engages in a low-intensity advertising campaign, Johnson & Johnson also is better off engaging in a low-intensity advertising campaign. So we can see here that these are we're mapping out all the best outcomes for the companies. So let's take a look at what the strategies for Procter and Gamble are. The best strategies for Procter and Gamble when Johnson and Johnson engages in a medium intensity or high intensity advertising campaign is to engage in a low intensity advertising campaign. So whenever Johnson and Johnson engages in medium or high we can see that Procter & Gamble's best response is to engage in a low-intensity advertising campaign because that will maximize their profits given those two strategies of Johnson & Johnson. If we take a look at when Johnson & Johnson engages in a low-intensity advertising campaign, Procter & Gamble is better off engaging in a medium-intensity advertising campaign. Their profits will equal six, whereas if they switch to high or low, their profits will fall to five. So the best strategies for Procter & Gamble are if Johnson & Johnson engages in a low strategy, low intensity advertising campaign, Procter & Gamble's best response is to have a medium intensity advertising campaign. And when Johnson & Johnson has a medium or high intensity 
advertising campaign, the best response for Procter & Gamble is to engage in a low intensity advertising campaign. If we take a look at Johnson & Johnson, Johnson & Johnson has best response when Procter & Gamble engages in high intensity, medium intensity, or low intensity advertising campaign is low. So you can see here that regardless of what Procter & Gamble does, Johnson & Johnson, its response is always to engage in a low intensity advertising campaign. Since that is their best response, regardless of what Procter & Gamble does, low is the dominant strategy for Johnson & Johnson. So by definition, that's what a dominant strategy is, the best response regardless of what your competitor does. Since Johnson & Johnson is always better off engaging a low-intensity advertising campaign, that is a dominant strategy. So we've mapped out the best strategies for Procter & Gamble. We've mapped out the best strategies for Johnson & Johnson and also identified um, the, excuse me, the, we've identified that low is a dominant strategy for Johnson & Johnson. The final part is, is there any Nash equilibrium? If you take a look at, here's one cell where it is the best strategy for both parties. Low for Johnson & Johnson and medium for Procter & Gamble. Well, the reason why we know low and medium is going to be a Nash equilibrium. Number one, we know that low is a dominant strategy for Johnson & Johnson. They are always going to pick this. So it is always their best strategy. Also, if we take a look at Procter & Gamble, it is their best strategy given that Johnson & Johnson picks low. Because if you take a look at this, they have a profit of six. Procter & Gamble has a profit of six whenever Johnson & Johnson has a low intensity strategy. If Procter & Gamble switches to high, their profits fall to five. And if they switch to a low intensity advertising campaign, their profits fall to five also. And if we take a look at this particular cell, does any party have any incentive to, to deviate from this? So let's take a look at Johnson & Johnson. We're here at low for Johnson & Johnson, medium for Procter & Gamble. If Johnson & Johnson decides to go from a low to a medium intensity campaign, their profits fall to four. And if they decide to go from a low to a high intensity campaign, when Procter & Gamble engages in medium, their profits only equal three. So there's no incentive for Johnson & Johnson to switch from low to medium or high. Let's take a look at Procter & Gamble. Does Procter & Gamble have any incentive to switch from a medium campaign, a medium intensity advertising campaign, when Johnson & Johnson has a low intensity advertising campaign? Uh, the answer is no, because here is the payoff for Procter & Gamble. If they switch to low, their profits fall from six to five. And if they go from a medium intensity campaign to a high intensity campaign, their profits go from six to five. So at this equilibrium is considered a Nash equilibrium because there is no incentive for Johnson & Johnson and Procter & Gamble to deviate once Johnson & Johnson selects a low-intensity advertising campaign and Procter & Gamble selects a medium-intensity advertising campaign. Now we move to Q&A 12.2. And this one says, Amazon faces the other group, which consists of ebook manufacturers other than Amazon, in a game in which the players choose a format as the profit matrix shows. And that will be coming up shortly. What are the pure strategy NAS equilibria if the firms choose their format simultaneously and are free to choose either format? Determine the mixed strategy equilibrium, if any. So here is the payoff matrix. We have other book readers here the Amazon Kindle, and we can see here the payoffs. If both parties select the AZW uh, format, Amazon has a profit of three, and the other book readers have a profit of one. If Amazon selects the AZW format and the other book readers select the EPUB format, Amazon has a profit or loss of one, and the EPUB readers, the other group of individuals, also have a loss of one. If Amazon selects EPUB and the other ebook readers select AZW, Amazon loses a dollar and the other book publishers also lose a dollar. And if Amazon and the other ebook readers both select the EPUB format, 
Amazon's going to have a profit of one, and the ebook readers are going to have a profit of three. So if we take a look at this, let's see if there's any pure strategies that uh, occur. So what we're going to do is take a look at what's going to be the best responses for each of these firms. So let's take a look at here, and I click that just to show that if Amazon selects the AZW format, okay, I'm sorry, if, if the other book readers select the AZW format, which strategy is better off for Amazon? Amazon is better off selecting the AZW format also because its profits will equal three versus selecting the EPUB, which will cause their profits to be negative. Now let's assume that the e that the other book publishers select the EPUB format. What's the best strategy for Amazon? Well, if the other book readers, the other companies out there select EPUB and, and Amazon selects the AZW format, Amazon's profits will be negative one, but if they also select the EPUB format, their profits will equal one. So if the other book readers select EPUB and Amazon has an option, they will want to select EPUB because they have positive profits versus losses. Let's do the same thing for the other book readers and see what their best strategies are. So if Amazon selects the AZW format, what's the best strategy for the other companies that are out there? Well, if Amazon selects AZW and the other companies out there select AZW, their profits will equal one. But if they select the EPUB format, their profits will be equal to negative one. So the other publishers out there are better off if they select the AZW format when Amazon selects the AZW format. Let's assume that Amazon selects the EPUB format. What is going to be the best response of the other publishers to that? Well, if they select the AZW format, their profits will equal negative one. But if they also select the EPUB format, their profits will equal three. So they're better off selecting the EPUB format when Amazon selects the EPUB format. Well, for these, the best strategies you can see here that AZW, AZW is an equilibrium. There's no reason for either party to deviate from that. But also the EPUB, EPUB strategy is also an equilibrium. When we're at this point here, neither firm has any incentive to deviate. If we're at the AZW, AZW format, Amazon won't switch to EPUB because their profits will go from negative one. I'm, I'm sorry, their profits will go from three to negative one. All right. And if we're at AZW for Amazon and AZW for the other book publishers, the other publishers won't switch to EPUB because their profits will go from one to negative one. And if we go from this uh, cell in the payoff matrix where they both select EPUB, there's no incentive for either party to deviate. If we start at a, a point here where, they, where Amazon and the other publishers both select EPUB, Amazon will not switch to AZW because their profits will fall from three to negative one. And if we look at the incentives for the other book publishers, if we're at an EPUB, EPUB equilibrium, the other book publishers won't switch to AZW because their profits will go from one to negative one. So the final part here is that we want to take a look at the mixed strategy. So we looked at the pure strategies. We have two pure strategy equilibriums. We want to take a look at a mixed strategy equilibrium. All right. So if we move forward, other ebook readers select the AZW format with a probability of AZW. So the mixed strategy is based upon taking a look at uh, the probabilities uh, of your uh, opponent in the game selecting a particular format. So what we want to know is what is Amazon's expected profits when selecting the AZW format. All right. So we're assuming that the other book readers are selecting the AZW format. All right. What is Amazon's expected profits when selected the AZW standard? All right. 
so their profits will be, and if we go back to the original matrix, that if we know that the probability of the other companies selecting AZW is a particular number, if we just multiply that payoff, which is 3, multiplied by that probability, that gives us the expected value of that one, of that particular payoff. But also, that also means that if the other book companies are selecting AZW with a probability of a, that probability that we talked about, that means there's a probability that they will select the other format, which is equal to 1 minus that probability. Remember that there's only two formats they can select. They can select the AZW format, or they can select the EPUB format. So the probability of them selecting the EPUB format is just 1 minus the probability of them selecting AZW. So when, if that's the case, if Amazon selects AZW and the other book companies select uh, the, the EPUB format, Amazon's profits are going to be equal to negative 1, and the probability of that occurring is 1 minus PAZW. So what we're doing is getting the expected profit when Amazon selects the AZW format, given the probability that the other companies are going to select AZW with one prob probability, and then given that there's only two different formats, that the probability of them selecting the other format is 1 minus probability AZW. So if we ca calculate that through, we get 3PAZW plus negative uh, 1 plus PAZW. And if we solve that all the way through, we get 4PAZW minus 1. Now that's only a portion of what we need to know. All right, so we need to know um, that is their expected profits when they select AZW, given the probabilities of what their competitors are going to do. Now we have to do Amazon's expected profits when selecting the EPUB standard. So when they select the EPUB standard, if that's the probability of AZW, that if they select EPUB and the other book publishers select AZW, they're going to have losses of negative 1. All right. So it's negative 1 multiplied by the probability that the other companies are going to select AZW. And then we have to take a look at what are the profits of Amazon if they select EPUB and their opponents select EPUB. So if we take a look at the payoff matrix under that, Amazon is going to have a profit of 1 multiplied by 1 minus PAZW. If we work that out, we end up with the expected value of that scenario as 1 minus 2 PAZW. In order to get the answer for this, Amazon has to be indifferent between these two outcomes, i.e., this outcome here has to be equal to this outcome here. So we have 4PAZW minus 1 equals 1 minus 2PAZW. If we add 2PAZW to both sides and we add 1 to both sides, we get 6PAZW equals 2. And we get PAZW equals 1 third. We do the same thing for the other companies. So if Amazon selects the AZW format with the probability of AZW, what is the other group's expected profit? All right, so we're going to take a look at when they both select AZW. We can look at the payoff matrix and see that the other group's profits are equal to 1 times the probability of Amazon selecting that. And if the other group selects EPUB, no, I'm sorry. If Amazon selects EPUB when the other group selects AZW, uh, their profits are at negative 1 multiplied by 1 minus PAZW. And remember that the, these two probabilities have to equal 1. If we multiply that through, we end up getting 2 PAZW minus 1 is the expected outcome. What are the other group's expected profits when selecting the EPUB standard? So when they select the EPUB standard, and we have a probability of Amazon selecting the AZW standard, all right, so we get 
that the profits for the other group are going to be negative one times the probability that Amazon selects e PAZW, and that's plus the profit, which is equal to three, multiplied by one minus PAZW. If we work that out, we get that that expected outcome is negative four PAZW plus three. In order for the other group to be indifferent between those two outcomes, we have to this 2PAZW minus 1 equals negative 4PAZW plus 3. So that's what we've done here. We've equated that to one another. If we add 4PAZW to both sides and add 1 to both sides, we get 6PAZW equals 4. And then when we divide by 6, the probability PAZW is equal to two-thirds. 12.3 Jane is interested in buying a car from a used car dealer. Her maximum willingness to pay for the car is twelve, twelve thousand dollars Bo, the car dealer, is willing to sell the car as long as he receives at least ten, ten thousand dollars Thus the potential surplus or gain from trade is two thousand dollars. Jane and the deal dealer bargain over the transaction price P. If they cannot agree on a price, then the transaction does not occur and neither party receives any surplus. What is the Nash bargaining solution for this game? So we have to remember that Jane's surplus is the 12000 or the twelve minus the price she actually pays for it, while Bo's surplus is equal to the price minus the, uh, the lowest he's willing to sell for it. So Jane will generate surplus of 12,000 minus her actual price. Her willingness to pay is 12. We subtract off the price she actually pays, that's her surplus. And the surplus for Bo as the seller or the supplier of it is going to be the price that he actually sells it for minus the lowest he's willing to accept. Here we can use the Nash product. The Nash product is just the surpluses generated by both individuals. So the Nash product here is going to be the surplus of Jane multiplied by the surplus of Bo. And if we write that out, the Nash product is going to be equal to 12 minus P minus uh, multiplied by P minus 10. We multiply that out and we get the Nash product is equal to 12 P minus 120 minus P squared plus 10 P. If we simplify that, we get the Nash product is equal to 22p minus 120 minus p squared. All right, all we did is we put, you know, added 12p to 10p to give us the 22p. Uh, in order to find the maximum of this, if we take the first derivative of it, we get 22 minus 2p is the first derivative of the Nash product. To get the maximum, we set it equal to 0. Don't know why that came up twice. Apologies for that. So we have 0 equals 22 minus 2p. We get 2p equals 22. And if we solve for p, p is equal to 11. So the price that maximizes the Nash product for this particular transaction is equal to 11.